hi, Gerard. Um, nice catching up with you. Um, just before I introduce you, or before I actually do introduce you, I want you to maybe tell me or tell the viewers um, a little bit about yourself. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So I am an entrepreneur, um, very passionate about creating things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, just a short instance on my background. Um, I started off in sales. My whole entire life's goal when I left high school was to end up being a pastor. Needless to say, I got knocked into a different life since matric and I ended up in sales almost by accident. Um, it became such a passion of mine that I cannot see myself leaving sales ever um, because it's, it's, it's such a, it's a wonderful dancing conversation that you have with people. And obviously when you're trying to get a product to someone now, as time went on, I obviously grew in that aspect and learning the difference between selling a product and actually finding the value uh, that you could contribute. Um, that has been very critical in my, in my career path. Um, I then obviously ended up um, moving from working for someone, growing with a, growing with the desire to be able to um, build a business, step, step up and do something, step change my life that I just felt was extremely important. Um, obviously, you know, you, you create plans on Excel and then you get life. <laughs> so I, I, I'll be honest with you. I normally, if I'm even in a meeting, you know, and we always talk about, you know, um, you know, we talk about projections, we talk about what the possibilities are and with being in sales as long as I've been, um, I'm not the best at the moment, but I'm striving to be one of the best. And, um, one of the things that I always end up with, you know, I'm glad we're done with the Excel conversations because now we need to find out what the real crux of the matter is when we actually go out into the field. Because you have your ideas, you have your plans, you have everything that you feel is gonna perfectly work out. But life has a weird algorithm that just changes things. And depending on how adaptable you are to the circumstances is basically make or break. But um, in short, um, I've learned a lot about myself in terms of resilience, in terms of perseverance, in terms of um, just getting back up again. Um, I've learned that my, my capacity to be able to push through and stay consistent with something irrespective of whether it's consistent in someone else's eyes or not, it's not, it's inconsequential. It's whether I'm consistent with the vision, the idea, just getting back to it, going back to the drawing board. And those are some of the things that I've learned, um, ex passe on Excel. So <laughs> when I'm outside of my Excel world and I get into the real world and I realize, okay, fine, there are times you've got to stop for a while, take a moment. And um, yeah, man, I'm very passionate about sales, I'm passionate about uh, uh, martial arts, um, love reading. I'm not going to lie, I like staying clued up. I'm not always 100% clued up, but I'm on the 99 percentile of being clued up and stuff. <laughs> so I'm not the best, but um, I, I, I love staying clued up. I'm not going to lie. I like listening to, I'm open-minded about a ton of ideas and so forth, but um, I always look for the one that's going, that's going to work in my economy in my country and then from that point onwards because you have to take a look at your environment and you know work on that ground on definitely that. definitely yeah. no awesome man that was uh quite a good intro uh quite a lot that you've said as well so um just one thing maybe that i want to that I want to jump on there is uh, the consistency part that you were saying. And like you said, um, it's inconsequential to anyone else of how they see your consistency. So also just jumping on consistency. Now you've been in entrepreneurship for quite some time. You've had yeah. uh, a few businesses and the one that I want to focus on now is the, is LaBelle's. So yeah, you can uh, just run me through what Labels does. Okay, so so we focus on re-engineering locally loved foods, right? So um, Labels focuses on all the stuff that we love in the wood. When I talk about Gatsby's, I talk about quarters, I talk about those type of things. So what we try and do is we try and add a gourmet spin to it. As a result, we obviously always are evolving the product, and. Um, <clears throat> That is something that we are passionate about. That is what it was birthed on. Because what I felt was, was that, you know, or everybody from the area that we grew up in was going to the fancy areas to get fancy foods. And what I felt was we needed to flip and reverse it because I really believe that we had, we, in our culture, we had foods that we could contribute to, 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 to the industry. Now, as time goes on, you kind of figure out, okay, fine. There are people, everywhere you go, doesn't matter, Cape Town, Johannesburg, 
PE, whatever. You kind of more or less doing the same thing, but what I didn't appreciate was, was that the, the, the standard and the quality of delivery just didn't speak to what I felt that we were capable of as a community as a result. And um, <clears throat> this is no knock on what anyone else is doing. I just felt that that spoke to me because I really felt that we needed to step change the product and step change it in such a way that we deliver on quality, et cetera, et cetera. So that's basically what we do. We also do coffees as well, um, various forms of gourmet coffees that you can enjoy as well. So that's what we do from our truck. We do pizzas, we do Gatsby's, we do burgers, we do wraps, we do cheese sandwiches. We also do, like I said, gourmet coffees. Um, <clears throat> what else is there that I can, yeah, we've got this really cool whip roll that we do. Flipping amazing. I think it's the best, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So it is the best in the sense that, you know, with the normal whip roll, they give you this little pink sausage, right? And they're putting a whole lot of chips on it with sauces and stuff like that. But we really mixed it up with, with red and white onions. We, instead of using a red sausage, we use a different type of sausage, which I love. We mix it up with some mince and whatever the case might be. And we put on all sorts of different types of flavoring to it, which I think is really, really cool. It's one of the products. One, one of the things about me is that um, I'm never completely satisfied with a particular product. But that one, I'm not going to lie, was really phenomenal. Really phenomenal. Awesome. I was Before happy. you start making me get hungry. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned that you guys operate from a food truck. Yeah. So um, how, how do you operate? Do you like uh, drive around and, uh, you know, honk at people or have a little ice cream bell? <laughs> how, how, are you, how is it that you operate? <laughs> Talk about that. I had an idea about that one. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway so, so what we do is, right, um, especially for Port Elizabeth, we have um, pretty much gone to businesses where I just kind of felt that if I'm going to be operating within a space, it's fair for me to go and speak to the family in that space, you know, the people in that space. So I approach the businesses and I say, listen, would you guys be okay with us being here? So what it does is it kind of avoids the complication of someone actually having an issue with you there because you already crossed that bridge because your idea is to get there and to sell. So we preset our, our spots, right? So we have the arrangement, we have the, the, the conversation, everybody's on the same page. Um, most of the people in Port Elizabeth are really fantastic, I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, they're very accommodating. Um, they're very, uh, uh, how can I say, collaborative most of everybody. I've had someone who actually tried to, who basically tried to get me out of the space here. <laughs> they weren't selling food though, but they were in a completely different industry. But um, needless to say, um, I've been really blessed to be able to collaborate with, with different types of, of, of brands, you know, um, from, we, we used to do some stuff for South Sea, we did some stuff for, for Caltex as well. Um, we've, we've, we've pretty much set up with, uh, with a, cellular comp, a cellular business where we work opposite them. We kind of create, try and create an ecosystem where customers come and buy and then they might want coffee or they might want something to eat, that kind of thing. So we have, we, we have different spots that we set up at, but obviously due to COVID-19 and South African dynamics in terms of like lockdowns, um, I, I, I love our president, you know, when he says with the immediate effect, he doesn't take into account your stock <laughs> that you bought that will expire in three days. <laughs> so, so that was also like a, a massive situation for us as well. But needless to say, um, with that, that's how we approach it. We do hook up the trailer. We take it to the spots that we pre-designated. We make sure that we mark it behind it. And um, we also ensure that we've got a website up and running that will be able to help people easily navigate from their mobile phones as well as from their desktop and so forth to be able to get to us because it's very hard to, to reach everybody if you are moving as much. Yeah. And if you're moving as much and then your faithful followers want to know where you are. We have people that literally travel the distance for us to come and see us. I mean, we were doing Barkins Valley, um, when was it, 2019? And um, we, because of the, all the places we had been to, these people are faithful to Bark Barkins Valley in a sense, you know, but I was so blessed that night when I had at least anything, I think it was between five and eight customers, different customers who specifically came before us. And that particular night we weren't operating because we had some challenges with the vehicle. And um, it, it was, it was I, I felt like I disappointed them, but at the same time, I felt chuffed because I was like, now I'm, it's like <laughs> you're, you're, looking you're following that one and no, you're looking for me as a result, which, are, which is very exciting. Yeah. But, um, you know, obviously with COVID-19, keeping that consistency has become such a, such a challenge because no business was allowed to operate for a while. 
we also have to take into account the economics, sustaining staff and so forth, etc. Will there be enough people that will be able to come? The safety people that has taken into consideration to go out or stay in. Those yeah. are very, very pertinent questions that people have at the moment. Awesome, man. But yeah. Yeah, definitely. So just looking at your your business, um, having the, the truck. So if anyone had to want to do what you are doing, um, whether it be here in the city or in another city or in another country, um, mm -hmm. looking at the truck itself, what is it that you look at that um, it needs to be equipped with or that you think is very important to get what you are doing right now done? Okay, so... <clears throat> So obviously, it might vary from city to city in terms of the laws. Those are the basics you've got to get out of the way. You need to have permits. You need to have a health and safety certificate or a health health and food sorry food and food safety certificate that needs to be given to you. Um, they do an inspection. They come and check it out. They say, okay, fine. Listen, this is the circumstance. Because I remember when I had mine, my first one, um, someone came in from the municipality to actually look at this kitchen, because there are certain standards that you've got to have when it comes to food. Um, there are permits in terms of operating that allow, that allow you to be at certain spots. So you need to obviously, first and foremost, before you decide, find out exactly where your spot is going to be, find out exactly who you need to speak to in the municipality and so forth. Um, and then you make a decision in terms of like, listen, should I get a truck? Should I get a trailer? You know what I mean? Because if you're looking at a food truck, a food truck, the actual food truck, will cost you north of 500,000, whereas a food trailer will cost you probably about 35,000, maybe 25,000 rand. That's just rands. Um, so you that's that's without branding, without anything else. A lot of them do have already pre-existing equipment within them. So what I did was I chatted to a company back in 2014 in, in, in Gauteng. We, I was looking, me and a friend of mine, we were looking for a spot to, uh, to basically someone that can manufacture this thing. We were very excited. We said, hey, even if we make 500 rand a day or maybe 7,000 for the month, we've got a business, it's working. <laughs> so we ended up going to Jacaranda in his London, <laughs> only to find out <laughs> that it was Jacaranda in Gauteng. <laughs> so, which is the difference between... <laughs> I'm telling you, 300 kilometers and basically a thousand kilometers. It was like that bad. So um, anyway, so I ended up getting to Jacaranda in Gauteng at some point. And um, I went with my dad. And what we did was we, we spoke to these trailer manufacturers and um, I had a conversation with them. We spoke about price, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, at that particular point in time in my life, the pricing was out of my, was basically out of range for me. And um, I, I really wanted this truck. Needless to say, I did say to them at that point in time that I will come and buy a truck from him. That is what I said. I left with everything that they told me that they could do. So was this yes, a truck or a trailer? This was a trailer. Okay, okay, cool. So I force of habit because of the, our culture. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, in South Africa, we basically, the trailer, we just refer to it as a food truck. <laughs> but nonetheless, thank you for the correction. Um, but the, the reality is, is that with this trailer, when I went up, they told me exactly everything that they could do, right? They, they gave me free, free, free reign in terms of design, what I wanted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously a lot of the time cost was pretty much managing my, my creativity. Thing. So as a result, um, I left that. I came to PE again. Um, I think about a year later, a year and a half later, um, I ended up in a, in a situation where I, I pretty much was without a job basically. And um, I remember sitting in, 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 the, in my mother's house at this particular time, because I had just moved back in. And um, I had this 200 Rand at this moment. This was like all the money I had. This wasn't, I, I wasn't sitting with like a secret stash somewhere. I was just, this was like everything I had. I'm like, I just say to myself, this is the brokest I've been since like, since I started working. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, look, I've been broke before, but I mean, you know, as a worker, you are broke. <laughs> You know, you've got that money coming at the end of the month with that situation. That was it. There was nothing else coming on the 25th for me. So I was, so I sat there and I was like, I was completely, completely, I would say, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Blown away by, by, by the fact that, you know what, this was a make or break for me. I had to decide. So I was pretty much on the ground with this one. And then I was pacing up and down. I, I, I used to have an iPhone at this point. Now I've got this little tiki tolly, what we call as one of those hundred phones. 
And uh, how I ended up there is a story of legends. <laughs> and the list, I'm making calls with the little airtime that I have. So then I decided I need to double this money somehow. And that was at that moment that I remembered the idea that, I, that me and a friend of mine had where we said, listen, let's start this food thing. And at that moment in my area in Boysons Park, there wasn't much food places available over weekends. And the sad thing about Boysons Park is that, you know, most of the money is made on, on the weekends. And you can't actually operate Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You can only operate Friday and Saturday. So that was the challenge I was caught up in. So what I did was I eventually <clears throat> went ahead. I, I, I ended up getting a, a, a little order, right, from one of the companies here in PE. Anyway, I, I then got someone else to make the food because I wasn't savvy with this whole scenario. And he made the food. He made what he made bunny chows, right? Needless to say, the people were so upset <laughs> that they, they said, this is not a bunny chow. This is a stew. They were so upset about it. And I couldn't refund them. But I, I sadly, you know, um, on the flip side, my money had tripled. <laughs> so, so then I was like, okay, these people are never going to order from me again. And that was that. And I was like, you know what? I don't know. I wanted to fix it. But uh, given the circumstance, I was, you know, I was pretty much in a corner. So then what I decided was, the cool thing was the people that had ordered, they, they, they didn't uh, how can I say, express the dissatisfaction to such an extent that it became a major issue. But they, they eventually said, look, this is the situation as a result. And you know, this is a steal. And as a result, I didn't get an order again from them at that point in time. This was like the first time I did an order and whatever the case might be. And I took that money that I had, which was 200 rand, it became 800 rand. I then ended up buying bread, I ended up buying rolls, I ended up buying whatever, and potatoes and blah, 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 as best as I could. And I made flyers. I handed the flyers out. I think it was easy, 300 or 400 flyers that I handed out in Boysons Park. And for, needless to say, for the next three weeks, nothing happened, no one came. The first night I had someone working there. That first, we supposed to close at like 10 or 11. This guy just upped and left at seven o'clock in the evening. Oh, wow. <laughs> he left. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and I, and I found him like, what happened? And he said to me, look, there was nobody and whatever the case might be. And I think that for me was the first time that I just sat down and I thought to myself, you know what, gee, you're going to be alone in this as a result. You don't have that. You, I don't think I'll have that dream story where I had this employee that stuck with me through thick and thin or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I, I just realized that I am the employee. I am the flipping guy who's going to be everything. here. I'm going to be the cooker. I'm going to be the seller. I'm going to be the the, the, the guy who acquires the stock, I'm going to be the guy who's going to sit down and make sure it balances. If these people don't show up, I need to show up. That's what I realized at that particular moment. But I, 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 I kind of just, how could I say, I was a bit disappointed because it, it gets discouraging because you like, there's no one coming. You think food sells and whatever. The, food sells, but not everyone's food sells. <laughs> yeah. So there's that. So, I, so eventually what happened was um, sometime later, the same guy was there messaged me about another lady living in the area. And she said to me, he said to me, look, this lady can cook. She's worked in a fast food place before. My, my luck was so, I would say by the grace of God, so it was almost serendipitous the way that whole situation came together because I, I have to give her credit for, 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 for the work that she's put in. Um, she came and she, it so happens that she's popular in Boys and Spa, like popular. And I, I didn't know this. I didn't know anything up until this point. So I just thought, get the stock, get someone who can make the food, that's it. Only to find out afterwards that she was letting everyone know behind my back that she's selling here now. And I'll tell you something, it went from night and day. Basically, that was the difference with having her there. And um, we had then pretty much grown as a result. We were, we were making from nothing. We weren't making millions as a result, you know what I mean? But it, we made enough to build our first trailer within the space of... I think it was three or four months that same year. It's all good. First trailer. Mm. Yeah, it was fantastic, but it took a lot of sacrifice because I, I just made sure I had my basics, you know what I mean, sorted out, like, you know, my wine. Um, I had wine once a week, so I bought one <laughs> that I had to kind of just hold on to for the entire <laughs> week. And then the balance was like stock and savings, stock and savings, and whatever uh -huh. the case might be. And um, eventually, when we bought the first trailer, that was also a story in its own we bought that one but we made it cheaply um i had a chassis that i bought and um 
it was such a mess of a story. I thought it would be an easy situation to get it swapped over to your name, but this is what happened. I eventually found out that the trailer itself, the chassis itself was someone that was in someone's locked in someone's estate. Oh, <laughs> the wow. person died with their name uh-huh. and I couldn't do anything. But um, we, but I continued. <laughs> I continued <laughs> the list. I just said, you know what? I need I need money. That is just what it is now. And I and I built this thing. We just continued building it. And it, 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 we were operating with a trailer that was basically unlicensed and everything. And and I was just like, you know what? If they found this thing, whatever. I just want to make a few thousand. That's gonna push me through to the next level. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was the challenges we face. So maybe just um, on that point, Jira, sorry, um, you were speaking about the, the, the truck, and I think this was uh, one of the things that I wanted to know um, earlier as well. Um, in this case, you are building your, your truck yourself, or, well, not yourself, but, you know, you kind of paying yes. someone to, yeah. to actually do it for you. So um, okay, run yeah. us through the, the specifics of what's inside the, the trailer. Okay. So, okay, so just to conclude on that, because I actually want to talk to you about that, the, the other truck, which was actually much better in result. Um, with the first one that we built, um, I put in two deep fryers, two burners, basically. It's not even flat burners, right? For burgers and whatever the case might be. Okay. It's, it's normal gas burners, like your two plate, yeah. right? That's what I had. That was what I operated with because I had worked a menu that can accommodate that scenario, right? So it wasn't like the best scenario on the planet um, or I came out and I had all this money and had the best equipment from the jump. Um, It was really just a situation of like, these are my bare necessities at this point in time. And that was what that one required. We then managed to to build things up to such an extent that we ended up paying cash for the second one, right? And um, the second one was the one where we went to Jacaranda um, to to, to go and buy it in Gauteng. Um, what had eventually happened was they built one for us. This one was absolutely phenomenal. It was really phenomenal. It was, it was day and night in comparison to the first one we had built. It was basically the way we built it was, was a friend we knew, great guy, friend we knew, but he had no experience with regards. He could do burglar bars and gates. He had no clue on how to build a what's thing. So I said to him, listen, bro, let's just try this and see how we get it. Right. And that's mm-hmm. how we ended up building that. Okay. It wasn't up to the standard of this one, but it's not a thing of like, he couldn't do the job. He just didn't have the experience these guys had as yeah. a result. So, so what, to say, what, is, what is in the, the, the second one that you got? What, what makes it so phenomenal? <laughs> so what makes it phenomenal, right? We had actual proper deep dishes in there. Two of them, five liters each, right? Okay. The entire yeah. piping was done so professionally. that you, You've got these little nozzles that can turn the gas on and off and manage the, the, the heat as a result. So we, we also had the griller which you could actually grill stuff on there, chisenyama, whatever it is, the case might be, you can actually grill on there. Um, that was perfectly cool. We also had two burners on the one side as well for pots and pans and stuff like that. Then we added, then what he included in there was a, a, a chafing dish, right? Where you could, it's almost like a warmer, right? You can put stuff in there, keep things warm as a result. Um, it had a sink in there, which was absolutely critical, which we didn't have. We had a sink in there. Um, he included two water bottles, uh, two 25 liter water bottles to basically have water in the system. Mm-hmm. The thing had its own drainage and everything, which was absolutely critical. Um, <clears throat> the serving window was much better managed because the way that they built the hinges, right, was to open it up from the bottom, you open up and you open down. So it gave it a much more wider room of facility, whereas the first one we had was, it was so small the way that it was built and you know you had to keep it up so what we did was in order the first one we kept up with a with a square <laughs> you know that square that you just build with <laughs> that was the one <laughs> yeah we kept it up with the square this one however had all the other mechanism that was included it had other venting windows etc for smoke and stuff to go out etc the piping was laid professionally i'm telling it was really really wonderful and um Chassis, the base part of this chassis, it was registered new, right? <laughs> and in it is brand new. So I'm the first owner, which made me very happy. No dead people and, attached. Uh, <laughs> no dead people attached. That was uh, respect to the people. Um, no dead people attached. And uh, everything was like, very, it was very, 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 very professionally done. I loved it. But I think the most important part was, was that I, what I loved about it was it's, 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 it's presentability. I could actually take it to events. I could actually take it to places and be proud of this thing, you know, and um, that was absolutely important because people, 
the one thing about about people in general is that when they're buying food they want to know what your kitchen looks like right they want to know how clean your kitchen is they want to know everything about that so i could actually literally open the door and show people this is what the kitchen looks like so yeah. people, everybody comes in is like hey wow nice kitchen what does it look like i didn't have to hide anything so i open up the door <laughs> and i'll be like this is like I'd be impressed with everything you know what i mean and and whatever the case may be and that's what i loved about it is that i couldn't i didn't have to stay within my area because in my area um the the standards of 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 is, is a lot lower you know what i mean for for like a delivery when it comes to someone working out of their house now i'm not saying it's the standards are lower the guys aren't as fussy now i'm not yeah. saying that uh, when i say this i'm not saying it in a negative connotation but what i am saying is the guys are less fussy because we like oh, this is the wood everywhere you go if you're in the wood it's like oh, this is the wood so <laughs> unless the place looks decent he's selling from his it's fine so so with this scenario changing the first kitchen to the second kitchen really allowed us to kind of broaden out into different areas where they are more flu- affluent and we could form part of events that would that they, where the standards are higher for trailers yeah. and for food trucks as a result definitely so that was that I would, yeah, yeah, I want to touch on, on, on events in a bit, uh, but just again about the trailer. So when you when you got the trailer, is it already you know um, branded uh, or is that like optional? Do you have to do that separately? You have to do that separately. Okay, cool. You have to do that. Separately. And you would obviously have to find someone else, or do the the people who made the thing do they brand it as well? Look, um, the 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 with the branding. They didn't do branding. They didn't offer branding. Okay. So I didn't okay. ask for branding. Okay. I came for the kitchen. So my recommendation would always be like, you know, if you can, if you can get it done in house, sometimes it's cheaper, sometimes. But most of the time, from my experience, is that it's most likely because they try and they work in certain costing factors because yeah. they outsource it. So if they're outsourcing it to brand a, a kitchen like mine, the average going price is fifteen thousand rand, right? And you you when you give it to them, this guy most likely because he's outsourcing it, he's going to put a small markup on it. Yeah. Could be two and a half, could be five thousand, which then means you have to pay seventeen and a half in foot or twenty thousand rand for it. So you've got to really look at what is the what what costs are you looking at? You. So what I did was I went to someone I knew, and that person basically look I I I went to them. They had then put on this wonderful, uh, 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 they designed everything. They took the measurements of the kitchen, whatever the case might be. Phenomenal, phenomenal work. I'm not going to lie. The thing that I loved about him was that um, he, he actually captured what I was saying, how I wanted it to look. I actually took it to a, the, the initial branding. I took to a company that did work for what, the big ports here in PE um, for Kucha. They did their logos, did their branding, did all these kinds of things. So you would think that, a company of that level of professionalism would be able to deliver on what you want as a small guy. Yeah. But I was, I'll be honest with you. I was sadly disappointed with what they had delivered that I never ended up using their design for branding in terms of, you know, what they wanted to give me because they ended up wanting to make my kitchen look like the others. And I didn't want that. I wanted my one to look very different because I wasn't competing against, against other food trucks. I, yeah. I still am not competing i've got other guys that i've got my mind on that i want to that i'm competing against and um needless to say um you have a vision that you want to put down you want something that that speaks to the culture of your kitchen the culture of the brand that you want to build and that was absolutely critical to me so eventually what happened was um i ended up speaking to a friend of mine who owns um dove designs and um he then uh tony dove um he then took everything and he, we, we, we sat down, we sketched out and et cetera, et cetera. And what he did was he took what I had in my mind and he just put it on paper for me. He sent me mock-ups of how the kitchen is going to look, allowed me to make changes. What I loved about him was the attention to detail. So my logo has got the circle with labels in it, right? In cursive. And it's got these little dots inside the circle. He actually noted that the dots from this professional company that made it better, there were dots missing and the dots weren't all the same size. Oh wow! He was a noticed that, and he fixed that completely for me. And he took that's how much the attention to detail he 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 paid it. To, he paid that's how much how much he paid it. <laughs> <laughs> how yeah. much things so, he paid? 
I do the detail. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm just listening at and, and what you're saying about the branding now. So this guy's this guy's uh, your friend, like you're saying. Would would someone else be able to get that kind of um, quality on a product or branding for that for that matter um, if they didn't know the person? Do you think? Yeah, look, they definitely Not would. This guy specifically now, some just just oh, anyone else. Look, yeah, look, it's 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 very difficult to say. It's very difficult to say. Um, I've sent stuff out to be branded or to be done by other people that um, that that lots of times it wasn't done to the way that I wanted it to be done. Um, I've ended up becoming very, um, um, how could I say, I'm not a control freak around it, but I would say I, decide, I started taking other jobs into my own hands, the things I could handle. Yeah. Where over the years I learned how to do designing myself on, on Coral Draw and um, all the flyers I do, all my videos I do myself, all my editing I do myself. If there's something that I actually need a professional for, um, I would go to a professional. But the most important thing is this, is that through the entire process, you are in control because you are the one paying, basically. Yeah. So what I, so if you're going to someone, you definitely want to take a look at their portfolio. You want to see what they've done. You want to see how much value they can add to you because you are going to give them your money. Yeah. And as a result, you've got to sit down and say, okay, fine. If they come to you and say, Oh, we need to change this. We need to change this. Or you, you come to them and say you want to change this and change this. They should be, they should oblige you in that process, and also bring to you their professional experience in terms of what the the, the I would say the psychology behind branding, yeah. and say to you, okay, fine. you feel that this color would work, this color would not work, but leave the total ownership of the end product in your hands. And that's what I loved about uh, 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 Dove Designs is that we we he brought his expertise to me. We sat down, we spoke about color uh, textures and stuff like that. We spoke about the, the, the type of quality of ink that we want to put on there because with, with, uh, with vinyls, there are different levels of ink. <clears throat> so what happens is, is that you could put up a vinyl and the vinyl's quality could fade after eight months and then you have to pay again to put a new one on. The entire process, he brought his professionalism to me and I brought my ideas, my thoughts to him. And I said, to yeah. him, this is how I want it to look. And I told him exactly what I wanted and what I said to him, look, I'm not competing against other food trucks. Because what I said to him was, was that what I didn't like was, was that with the other food trucks, the, the impression I have with their branding is that the food truck is a food truck is a food truck. You understand? My perception of a food truck is, is that when you come to one, you come for the experience. You come yeah. there for the conversation. You come there for that personal touch. You come there that to such an extent that may I be as bold to say that it would change your day. It makes things better. As a result, whereas you, if you wanted coffee, you could go to engine, you could go to wherever you wanted to go, but yeah. if you wanted coffee for the food truck, you want to come there for the conversation, that relationship, you yeah. want to come there for the And what I felt was, was that with most of the food trucks in, 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 in the ones that I know, you, you don't really see much of the difference. You see more, I would say more of the same. Yeah. And um, that's what we strive to do is kind of just stick like a sore thumb out and okay. try to do of what's different as opposed to more of the same. Yeah. So if, you, if you're going to buy a hot dog from us, you'd bet your bottom dollar you're not going to get the same one from someone else. That's how we operate. When we make stuff, that's how we make it. I don't want to be able to sit down. We make a burger. It's exactly the same as that burger. But yeah. if we're making a copycat burger, if we are going to make a copycat burger, we're going to make something that we saw from, saw from someone either in Europe or the United States because we want to try it. Yeah. That's how we... That's so, awesome, man. So yes... Yeah. Yeah, no, that is. I I can definitely um say that uh, your food is very different. <laughs> I mean, I've had quarters from like places in Clary Park that doesn't even look the same like yours, you know, <laughs> where it's just very <laughs> plain, you. very rough, rugged. You know, I cut the bread. There it is. There you go. Yeah. So so good. <laughs> well done for to to do that. Um, I just want to chat you. a bit about um staffing. So, um, yes. how how many how many staff do you have currently in the um, the trailer, um, excluding yourself if you are um, part of, of of that group? Okay, at the moment we operate with two. Okay, I have one who does the food and one who does the coffee. Okay, um, coffee mm -hmm. requires a specific focus. Um, I prefer to to have an individual on it because it's an art, it's a craft. Yeah. That's how coffee is. So it's when you're not... talking about coffee, um, I, I hear you saying it's an art and it's a craft. I just need you to explain a bit more like what you have in the trailer. Um, are you doing like yeah. just a, a filter coffee from like a filter coffee machine or 
you boiling a kettle uh, urn how, how are you doing that <laughs> we used to boil a kettle <laughs> but now now we actually have a we have we have an iberetal ib7 right um that is a, an actual barista coffee machine it's it's not one of the cheapest things to have to be honest with you this is not a i can do this at home situation you can if you want to spend money on a very expensive coffee machine that takes about 20 minutes to start up <laughs> but it's fine but the idea behind those type of machines is, is basically for industrialization it's it's pressure it's it's all the compact stuff that goes in it to be able to deliver and maximize the quality of the bean so so those are the that's the coffee machine that we have we've got a, a proper uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's an iberetal ib7 compact okay um we actually have a, a grinder grinder is also pretty expensive most people's coffee machines cost about 600 bucks to 2000 the grinder alone for us is like 10000 wow. that's just the grinder mm. and um mm. the coffee machine itself was like oh man it's through the roof <laughs> but i knew i i've been wanting one for years you know what i mean because i felt that you know it helps with creating all sorts of experiences for people Definitely. So nonetheless um you that's the type of coffee machine that we've got um I wish I could show you the picture it's absolutely beautiful um you can get some the the, <laughs> the uh the um the the porta filters that we've got is also pretty expensive i mean the porta filters generally go for about 350 400 bucks our temper is also around about 250 to 300 bucks um our our knock box basically costs about 500 bucks so this is not like your your re coffee situation. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, we don't like get just coffee is more expensive than your trailer. <laughs> I man, I I tell you the coffee is more expensive than my car. <laughs> that is for sure. But nonetheless the, the 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 idea behind it is that you know when you come there you want to be able to get a proper experience and that's what we're going for. Yeah. Is that you know what we we did sell coffee before that we heated up in a in a in a, in a kettle etc because that was what we could afford at the time. but when we got into a space where we could afford to buy a decent coffee machine and we could afford to buy all the bells and whistles that go with it i went for that because i knew this is what we needed to do the beauty about it is is that a coffee machine is very versatile um you can have it in your in your kitchen in your mobile kitchen you can also take it to events you can do it corporate functions you can do whatever you need to do with it and that's what's the beauty of it as well as the food truck itself is that you can you can do anything with it you could go set up at a spot if it's not working here you next day you can change mm-hmm. um you can bins you can go to corporate functions etc you can do what you need to do with it and what i like about it is you can take everything with you yeah and you can set up what it is, what it is that you're doing to sell to people yeah. that will enjoy your food definitely yeah. so i just want to know also because you're running a um a coffee machine and i'm oh, sorry um <laughs> the dogs at the door um so <laughs> with with the, those type of machines obviously it's it's quite um intensive on electricity um so it consumes quite a bit um how do you make sure that you have enough electricity um to power that thing as well as everything else that maybe um needs electricity in the trailer okay so so there are two ways that we operate if we have an arrangement with a business that can supply us electricity what we do then is we rebate them the cost of the electricity that okay. we pay as a result okay so that's what we do some people say okay fine listen you'll rent the spot out to you okay and then you can go that route um the other alternative is, is that we we do have a generator um it's an 8.8 kva um that's about a, that's a 7000 watt generator and um that thing it's it's basically the value of that the thing is about 14000 to up between 12 and 14000 so what the reason why we purchased that was for in the event of load shedding in the event that we are sitting in in no man's land where we don't have access to electricity but the traffic is great we have this so um that's how we ensure we have consistent power so petrol costs are obviously important in this regard um then also again when it comes to the electricity side of connecting to to a business you obviously they will monitor the electricity and they will say to you okay fine the one the arrangement i had with one of the business was really cool the arrangement was very simple they said look it's fine don't worry about the electricity just supply me and my staff with coffee in the morning that was mm-hmm. it awesome. and it was like three cups of coffee and i was like no problem you know so um at retail level it's costing like 75 bucks a day but that costs yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> basically next to nothing so i was like okay fine that's great so we did that and that was the last arrangement we had which i thought was really cool so yeah that that's that's how we managed the electricity but to start up you're looking at about maybe 
per day to run to, to, to basically run our kitchen, it was it was anything between seven and fourteen units per day. Okay, basically. Well, awesome, man. Thirty-four and thirty-five and yeah, pretty much. Yeah, well, that's cool. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I just want to um, hear from you quickly. So, lots of people think of um, food trucks or um, the food trailer as you know not not an actual formal business. Um, now, do you run this as a business? I mean, do you, you know you keep your books? Do you have to submit taxes and that type of thing? Okay, so you, you have to submit taxes. Um, tax clearance is important. Um, they, in South Africa, they, they, there is a barrier where you, if you don't reach that barrier, you don't pay tax. And then there's obviously that barrier where you go above and you do pay tax. So those are things that you have to take into account. We do keep track of books with us, right? We keep track of books. Um, we have a pod system that we use that helps us with sales, helps us manage inventory. Um, that also helps us to, to manage our books, manage our expenses and stuff like that and know what we are making and what we are not making, knowing whether a particular product works or doesn't work. Are we wasting our time putting resources into this product, resources into the raw materials? What are we doing? Now, the idea behind that is not simply just to Kind of, for me, the idea is that I don't want to kind of have a situation where I'm just doing it to run a food truck. What I'm doing is I'm trying to build up a track record for what I want to do next. And then, because obviously when, when I get to a space where I want to do next, and I, someone's going to ask me, so what have you been doing? What has been the turnover as a result? Because eventually I want to get into a space where I get more people involved um, from, from a different level, at a different level of conversation so that I can take the bells and then push it into a different, into a different, level of the game um so so that is the reason why i keep track of it i also keep track of it in case i get contacted regarding anything in relation to it that might be legally implicating as a result um and it also helps with tracking your rate of sale and those type of things mm. so that helps you understand like listen you're selling x amount of gatsby's x amount of burgers x amount of quarters then you know your gatsby's don't sell as well but your quarters are doing great so then you're like okay fine People prefer your quarter. So what you do is you you put more resources behind that versus you. Then you know, okay, fine. You're selling on average maybe two or three a day versus say 30 or 40 quarters a day or whatever the case might be on your quarter side. So now you know, okay, fine. If you've got a hundred rand, 80 rand of my money needs to go to quarters and 10 rand or 20 rand needs to go to the Gatsby's as a result. So that helps with that type of thinking, understanding those logistics because it helps you manage cash flow as a result. And when you manage cash flow, you know exactly, you need to know what your expenses are and what you are actually making. When you know what you are actually making, you know what your weaknesses are, you know what your strengths are, you know what you need to change, you know how to strategize, you know how to rethink the business as you go around. Because ultimately, as much as you want to give people an appreciable experience, you go into business for the purposes of making money. Yeah, That's the purpose of going into a business as a result. Definitely. All the other stuff like passion and love for food or love for IT or love for whatever, are, I would say, secondary to that, as in my view. So you need to think of it from a money perspective where you sit down and say, it's costing me, you can't run a business where it's costing you 13 rand and you're only making eight rand. You're making a, you're digging a hole for yourself. You've got to sit in a position and say to yourself, listen, if my business is, my cost is costing me 13 rand, what is it that I need to make in order to, to make that 13 rand? or alternatively get into a space where I'm making money to make moves because you obviously need to save, you need to live, you need to do all these things. Yeah. There's a term business that they call a margin of safety. Now, a margin of safety is anything, I think about up to 25% of gross profit where your where your overheads are costing you 100 rand, right? But your margin of safety is 25% above that, okay? That is where your, your margin of safety is. That means after you've been paid, after your rent's been paid, after your electricity has been paid, after your staff has been paid, after your petrol has been sorted, this is your overheads. Your margin in safety is the cream on top, over and above. Yeah. Now remember, over and above you get paid yeah. as well, because you as well. Because a lot of people don't count that part. They think the profit is where they make the money. Mm. But to, in all honesty, you have to give yourself a salary and then you've got to look at your margin of safety and that's where you save and et cetera. And it allows you to do other things yeah, as well. Definitely. That is important. Cash flow, managing books, managing your stock inventory, making sure that you're not riding around unnecessarily when petrol, especially in our country where petrol is a ridiculous amount of money, you really have to be careful about that because it might be 15 rand, but that 15 rand could easily accumulate to five and a half thousand rand at the end of the month, which you didn't have to spend on petrol. 
Yeah. So those are cost saving factors that you need to take into account. How much does it cost you to get from here to there? How many uh, uh, kilometers do you get out of one liter? How much petrol you've got to put in this car to make sure that you keep your costs managed so that you can then maximize. There's no point in going into business, but all your profit is going to a consumable expense like petrol. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. You really got to sit down and count those things. And that's how I manage it. That's how I sit down. I actually look at it. I have an Excel sheet where I say, okay, fine, these are my costs. What have I done this week that I need to change? What have I done this week that I need to look at differently? And how do I manage these costs better? How much will it cost me to put in petrol for the day? And can I live like this? Generally, a rule of thumb, put in a full tank, right? But it would be a wise idea to know exactly how much it costs you to run every day. Yeah, definitely. If it costs you a hundred rand every day, at least you know it doesn't have to cost you 6,000 rand a month. Yeah. So sense, what I'm definitely it makes lots of sense. I would love to jump into that a lot more and unpack that because um, that's quite interesting. And I think lots of people don't really look at how they run their business, especially through that lens. You know, um, those small little things like, um, buying takeaways for, for lunch every single day, you know, th those are things that, that does add up um, at the end of the day out of your pocket yeah. or if you're doing it from your business um, both ways. Yes. So just what I want to want to touch on as well now is um, I just want to get into a bit more of, of you and how you run yourself. Um, so being an entrepreneur, um, lots of people say it's not the easiest thing. Um, and lots of people have uh, a buddy that they can chat to or a mentor. Do, do you have something like that? And would you recommend um, that to, to people? I would highly recommend that. Um, I don't have a particular individual that I specifically go to. I do have two mentors that I count as mentors, right? But we don't, we're not in touch all the time. Right? When I see them, I see them and I talk to them or whatever, we have conversations as a result. But I more feed off the energy than I feed off the ideas because you need to surround yourself with the right people. And I think the energy is important to me. Um, what I, where, where, where actual mentorship comes in for me because you know, particularly in my industry, there, there aren't a lot of people that will kind of just sit down and you can go to and say, listen, this is the person that's going to help you kind of grow your business and help you manage that process. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's, Get that level of dedication out of people, I, I felt it would be unfair because then I would have to demand your time. Um, most of the time, if you're coming from a, from, from, from an, a historically disadvantaged background, you can't afford to pay for a mentor and that facility is available. And if you can afford to do so, do that um, because they are invaluable. But most of the time, uh, a lot of the, the ideas and the, the guys that have influenced my way of thinking, um, I've pretty much listened to guys on YouTube I've downloaded videos, I've downloaded MP3s, I've spent a lot of time listening to, to the likes of Les Brown, Earl Nightingale, um, listening to Steve Jobs talks when he has his actual talks, talks when he had it at, uh, uh, what's it, uh, what do you call it, at Silicon Valley, when he used to have those talks at his, at his auditorium, I listened to the whole thing, like a whole two or three hours, <laughs> yeah. I listened to the whole thing, mm -hmm. and um, I actually sit down and I'm like, I listen to stories about Jeff Bezos, for example, I look at guys in South Africa as well. One of the guys that I was reading up on was Johan Rupert. Um, I look at guys like Vusi Tebukayo in particular. I'm very, very inspired by him. Um, you know, for uh, I'm, I'm look. In short, I'm a very, very proud African. As a result, um, I do believe that all our resources need to be in house. You know what I mean? I don't like this whole importing scenario that we've got going on now. Mm -hmm. I really hate it because takes away from the culture that we are building and we're trying to develop especially from the ground up yeah. and um what i what i like to ch like i champion a guy like busi tempo i really champion him because aside from the fact that you know he, he, he makes logical sense in what he says um the fact that he's a he's a represent a representative of africa itself um we have a lot of people in that sphere that that in, the, in our local communities that i that inspire me as well um for example, there's a good friend of mine, Jerome Smith. You know, he's, he's such a brilliant, brilliant legal mind, such a brilliant businessman. You know, conversations with him, is, it's always fantastic. It's, it's very honed and very, um, I would say, uh, uh, um, what's, uh, this, what's the word uh, that I'm looking for? Um, you, you, you're, sitting, you're sitting and having an intellectual conversation with this guy, which I really enjoy a lot. And you need to surround yourself with that. So a mentor to me is not someone that you can actually go to. And I say, listen, I'm talking to Lance. Lance is the guy. 
You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You have to have various sources of mindsets that you can actually tap into because not everybody's ideas and, and conversations will speak to your vision. But if you've got a nice mix of people and a nice mix of voices that you can listen to, but they are more or less on the same trajectory. There's no point in talking to someone who one person you're talking to has a vision, but the other guy you talk to has got no vision. He's at home. He's not doing anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? You've got to have some, everybody has to be on the same path in terms of energy, in terms of goals, in terms of contribution, in terms of energy reciprocation as a result. So you having one mentor is not a rule. Having many mentors is the guide. So you can sit down and you can sit down and speak to different types of people, pick out their brain and say, okay, fine. Listen, what do you think about this? If not even that topic that you are battling with, have a random conversation with them. You can actually pick up on the energy that they have, the way that they think about things. And then you realize, hey, I need to step changes. I need to build up on this energy. I need to be able to level up to, 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 to this thinking and just get better. And that's the idea behind it is that you, you know what? The one thing that I've realized is that when it comes to business, not a lot of people actually want to give you the recipe, right? So you're out here and you're like, hey, give me the recipe for curry. <laughs> Let me tell you something. A family secret will remain that a family secret. Yeah. It's fine. But we will have conversations around the same recipe. Yes. How great the potato made, how the curry smells, all these type of things. And then you got to sit down and look at yourself and say, is this the standard of curry I want to make? <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. you got to go back to the drawing board and figure out exactly how to do that. And that's pretty much been my conversations because I've never gone into someone and said, you know what, tell me how you run your business. How do you make money? You know what I mean? Because what I realized was is that eventually, especially in Port Elizabeth, you know, people aren't really open-minded. I've met open-minded people who talk about it, you know, which is why I am, I, I'm more than happy to discuss, you know what I mean? Because I feel that one of the things that, that we don't do is talk enough about the horrors, you know what I mean, of the journey so that people can get an understanding and actually be educated about it. Yeah. That, you know, we all we bleed the same. Everybody goes through the same struggles. No one is unique. No one is special. You know what I mean? No one just sat there and made and had a family member just throw a million bucks at them and say, listen, get your car. You know, I like your idea. Go run with it. Pay me back when you can. I didn't have that. You know what I mean? So, so what I had was, was I read a book, read books actually. Um, I was inspired by people. People have influenced my mind. One thing I'll tell you again, I read books. Books are dangerous. I'm telling you now they are dangerous. They will change the way you think and see things. And that has influenced me. I've been influenced by people, by pastors, by leaders, by youth pastors and stuff like that, by friends. And that shaped the way that I think, thought and saw things. And that has influenced my trajectory. And, and with that said, mentors are critical. But there's a scripture in the Bible that says, in the counsel of many, there's wisdom. In the counsel of many, there's wisdom. So it's always good to have a, a variety of sources that you chat to. But have a variety of sources that are actually either A, within the industry or A, within the entrepreneurial business. They don't have to be in the exact same industry because it's more or less the same thing if you think about it. Yeah, no, definitely. Pencil is the same, if you will. Yeah. Now I get you. Uh, lots of wisdom there. Um, I just want to get into another question more about you. Um, there's <laughs> something I was thinking about actually when you were talking about the recipes um, and I'm sitting here and thinking, and yeah, I am asking this guy for his recipe to how he basically got to where he is now. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, just do, do you have something that you have uh, or that you do daily? Um, like if you listen to, to lots of these guys, uh, one of the guys that I actually didn't hear you say was uh, one of your, your favorites, my least favorite, Mr. David Goggins. Um, oh, you know? love that guy. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, hard. guys like those. <laughs> and uh, like you've mentioned, Steve, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, all those top CEOs that you hear about, they usually have something that they do daily, like they, they, they mantra, like they get up in the morning, they don't touch their phone for two hours, or they go to sleep and they jot down the goals or stuff like that. Is there something like that that you do? Yeah, there is something that I do, yeah. I do have a, a routine, um, a routine that I follow that is critical to me. Without it, I can't see how I would perform or not. You know what I mean? How I'd be able to deliver, how I'd be able to grow as a person. So routine is important. I will admit, I do struggle with one. (laughs) I struggle hard with one, but the other stuff is critically important to me. So the one that I struggle with, because 
Tony, uh, not Tony Robinson, um, uh, Robin Sharma has a book called The 5 AM Club, right? So I'm not going to lie. That is a battle for me. <laughs> so waking up at half past four to go jog is like, <laughs> I, I really I try. That book because I'm scared of it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even started. I haven't even looked at it to start. I was just like, you know what? I'm going to try it's, my best. It's sitting here right next to me. And what? See, that's, that's where I am. That's how much I've read. <laughs> Let me show you the book I'm busy reading now. Um, this is the book. Um, it's actually going to be my second or third time I'm reading it now. Oh, wow. Awesome. Um, this, is the, this is a book that I'm reading. It's basically by the H.R. Kelly group, um, Howard Stevens and Theodore Kinney. And um, what I love about it is, is that, yeah, based on 14 years of groundbreaking research by the HR Kelly Group of 210,000 salespeople in 15 industries and 80,000 customers they serve. So wow. they take that and try and break it down into numbers and stats, et cetera. And they give you the idea that, listen, what is it that the consumer is looking for? So it's got a lot to do with business to business sales, people to people sales, et cetera. So I love that book. I call, you can't read a book once. You have to actually go back to it again and read it again. I believe so it. I'm picking up it now for the third time and I'm basically going through it again. That's awesome, man. So, but just before you do, um, miss the, 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 yes, the routine. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to okay. know what it is that you actually do. Your routine. Okay, so so once a year, right, um, before the year starts again, uh, before the new year starts, I would say again, we don't want 2020 to mm, go again. Definitely so, <laughs> every year, on the last week of, of December, I spend time going through my goals for the year, right? I break them down into mind, body, and spirit. That's how I break it down. Uh, Mind, you have to look after your mind, right? If you don't look after your mind, you're going to be dead, quite frankly. Body, very important. You have to look after that. Or else you don't, you won't be able to do the things that you want to do. Spirit is also critically important because that is tied to your perseverance, your ability to deliver on consistency because life is really difficult. Um, you have a lot of people that hate your guts. Um, I love what Les Brown used to say, you know, um, don't tell your problems to people, right? He says, because 80% don't want to know about it and the other 20% are glad it's you. <laughs> so <laughs> that's pretty much how that sums that up. So people look after your spirit. So what I do is at the end of the year, I write down a list of goals that I want to achieve. So I look at the previous year. Now, every year I don't, you look, I don't always achieve everything 100%. To date, I haven't achieved everything 100%, but I've out of a list of 10, I've probably achieved four. And the rest of it is probably a number of dynamics that probably got involved, maybe a lack of understanding or um, financials or I had delays because look, this is life. The only thing that works perfectly with numbers is Excel. Beyond that, my friend, life has got its own. I can't even call it Facebook. <laughs> but that is just crazy. You have a plan. Life has got other things going on for you. So needless to say, um, I, I, I look at the previous year's plans and I look at what I achieved and what I didn't achieve. So out of the, say, for example, I had 10 goals. I achieved four. Then I look at the six. Then you really look at the six. When I say really look at, then you look at the priority of the six. Do I have to do this now? Is it important that it gets done? If I didn't achieve it this year, can I achieve it next year, right? Then that incorporates into my new goal set. So then I sit down and I say, okay, fine, these are the set of goals that I want to achieve. So for example, last year was supposed to be the year that we launched the, our actual um, restaurant, right? And um, I chatted to a friend of mine who's an architect. Um, we are happy to go ahead, but because of COVID-19, nothing happened, right? Yeah. So that the plans off so that's something i said okay fine it's not something i'm scratching off and saying never to be done but i'm parking it for when it's need, when it can be done for yeah. example so that's something that actually happened so needless to say i then sit down write down a new list of goals while incorporating these other goals in terms of priority in terms of can i make it happen is it possible i look at it realistically right there are, there's a difference between dreams and whatever so i work yearly you do have your five-year goal your 10-year goal but this yearly goal is specific to deadlines, is specific to in three months' time, in six months' time. Yeah. So what I do is I sit down and I say to myself, okay, fine, these are the goals that I want to achieve. I write them down. X amount of money. This is the car I want to get. This is the things I want to do. This is where I want to put the business, et cetera. Then I have a base set of goals. It takes care of my, me and my order, right? That's where my mind, body, and spirit comes in, okay? So I break them down. I actually have a spider web that I sit with. 
And I say, okay, fine, this is what I do. So it's not like a five pager, it's more like a one or two pager. So I sit down and I'm like, okay, fine, my mind, how do I look after my mind? Read books more. How many books can I read in a month? How many books can I read in two months? Can I read one book a month, etc.? This is what I want to do. Then I write down specific topics I want to focus on. I put those topics down and I say, okay, fine, this is what I want to do. I want to really look at sales. I want to redo really this. So one of the books, there are three books that I'm looking at now. Um, that's basically um, Achieve Sales Excellence that I showed you now. The other one is a five-minute MBA, which is a smaller book. Um, that's something I, I'm, I'm going to read again. Um, then there's another book uh, It's on the history of Africa. Very thick book. It looks like a Bible. So I'm going to be reading that. So that's not going to happen in a month, and I can tell you, <laughs> but it has to happen. And then obviously other books that I would like to read on in terms of politics. Um, one of the books that I want to read again is like um, the one that has intrigued me a lot was Apartheid, Guns and Money. And then there's the other one about Nelson Mandela. Bay. It's, uh, I, I can't remember the name specifically, but it's, it's, um, it was something to do with government and, uh, and a gangster state or something like that. Needless to say, I could be wrong about that title. <laughs> but when I see it, when I walk into books, I'm going to recognize it. But nonetheless, so the, 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 the first three books I already have. So I'll cross the bridge with the other books when I get there. But nonetheless, I make sure that, you know, it's topic specific for my mind. What is it I want to learn this year? Then I write it down and I pursue that. Spiritually, what is it that I need to do spiritually? I know I need to pray, right? So I spend time, I pray. Those are my personal things. I sit down and I'm like, I pray. I don't pray for three hours. I legitimately sit down and I pray for like maybe five or 10 minutes. I think the longest that I've gone so far has been 15 minutes, right? Just praying and talking to God. What I do is I don't, um, I'm not perfect in, by any way or any level. Um, my conversation with God is just that. It's a conversation. It's like what I'm having with you, except that I don't actually get a response. <laughs> but I don't have someone going like, yeah, Gerard, I actually see what's going yeah. on here. <laughs> But I talk to God because what happens is as human beings, we, 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 we bottle everything up, we keep it in, and um, we, we eventually, like a Coke bottle that's filled with gas, enough shaking will lead it to explode as a result. And there will be so much pressure and so much stress that the moment you open the bottle, all it does is it just starts foaming everywhere. And um, the way to manage levels of stress is I talk to someone I trust, and that to me is God. I sit down and I talk to him and I say, you know what? I can't afford to do this this month. I can't afford to do this week and it's stressing me out. I have a deadline and I know I'm going to miss it. And as deadlines go and you miss it, you disappoint people in that process because A, there are other priorities or B, if there's something else involved and you weren't able to acquire it in time and it has knock on effects in terms of what happens in that space. And you've got to be realistic with what your ability to, to, um, to deliver on certain things, your ability to achieve certain things. You could try your level best you, you think that someone's going to come through for you and then they don't and that then influences everything else behind you. So those are things that I sit down and I'm like, you know what, God, this is the situation. And I said to God, you know what, I need to get this kitchen sorted out. Lockdown is here. I'm, I'm concerned about a number of things and whatever the case might be. I take it to God. Now, in my experience with God is that, with the Lord is that, you know, my answers don't come then. They come with time as time goes on doors open up or I end up meeting people that lead me into a different way. Um, one specific moment that happened to me in 2019, um, I had just left a particular company and um, I just didn't know where I was going. I was just frustrated with the culture. I was frustrated with the way things were going and um, I just decided to go and um, I just didn't, my, my next move was I'm just going to focus on the business and that's as simple as that because we had been operating every day anyways. But I thought, you know, let me just go in full time and whatever the case may be and just do that. And um, needless to say, um, I went to God, right? And I said to him, you know what? Because look, we need to be realistic about things as, um, you know, I'm speaking specifically from a, a, an HDI perspective where I'm saying, you know what? You don't have money to manage the cash flow of a business, right? So there is no crime or sin in having a full time job and working your side hustle. There's no crime, right? It's something that you have to do because a business requires cash flow. So I went, so I thought I'm going to do this because I've done this before. Now, remember, when you started something with 200 and you think anything is possible, you are Gerard. Make this work. <laughs> it's so crazy. <laughs> you just like, you know what? You just go crazy. It's like, it's like I saw this meme where this guy was trying to pull a truck with his bicycle and it's the caption says, that's when you listen to too many motivational speakers and I can relate to the guy with the bike. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely relate to the guy. And 
couch and trying to pull a truck with a bicycle <laughs> because I feel so motivated it can be done. And that's the, that's, that's, that is a, a, either a problem or a blessing. I don't know. Whichever way you take it, I feel like that won't leave me. So needless to say, um, I went to God and, you know, and I said to God, hey, this is the situation. A business can only be done with cash flow. I need to take care of things at home and whatever the case may be. And it wasn't two hours, Lawrence, it wasn't two hours. And I had someone phone me, phone me and um, some years prior, I had helped this individual, right? He reminds me every now and again, and I forgot about it. And the only reason why I remember it is because once a year he phones me as an act of gratitude, I think, I don't know, but I did just say, no, it's cool. It's no issue, but I don't like remember the details, but then he brings up things that I'm like, yeah, this actually happened. <laughs> I'm like, I don't remember, but I forgot about it. I was that he awesome, just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yo, one in a million, I must have loved you. <laughs> But needless to say, um, what had then happened was we, I, I had helped him some years back. And he, what had subsequently happened was he phoned me two hours later after I prayed, right? And he asked me like, yo, what's, how are you, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, I'm good, or whatever the case may be. He said, we had a good conversation. So obviously in the sun, we're catching up in terms of where I'm at, where he's at, and stuff yeah. like that. And then he says, the same breath, he says, me, look, I might be able to do something here for you, et cetera. And as a result, you know, he then pretty much opens up the door for me as a result, which then I had to continue to close. And the reality is, is that, you know, never disregard the power of God. Never disregard the power of, of, of the Lord as a result or the power of helping someone and paying it forward and being kind to people. Being kind to people and being authentic is absolutely important because you never know. Now, you must remember, this is like, it's 2020. I'm talking like seven years later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you understand since that time yeah. you know uh, and 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 at the moment when i needed someone you know this was the guy randomly phones me out of the blue and we don't chat often maybe three times a year i guess you know and that is it and then he phones me at this particular moment and i never speak to people about things i go through really um but at this particular point in time i spoke to god and this is how god works and which is why i believe in the power of prayer and i believe in that because you have to let someone know you have to meditate and let someone know, listen, this is the situation. And I feel that God is that avenue for me okay. where I speak to him and things start happening. Now coming to the body, and that was a long story, but coming to the body, this is now where I feel it's absolutely important. Your health is extremely important. You cannot expect to be an entrepreneur if you do not gym, you do not train, you do not run, you do not walk, you do not do these things, you do not eat right. I'm not saying don't have a burger ever. You know, I have a burger, I had a burger yesterday. You know what I mean? And um, it, it was just yesterday. Today, I'm cutting out carbs and whatever the case may be. And for the rest of the week, I'm just focusing on eating healthy. I run about a 5K almost every second day. And um, every other day I'm at the gym, but it's not as consistent as my running because I prefer road running as opposed to treadmill running. At this point, I'm trying to get consistency with actually just going to the gym because, you know, um, the gym is it's a in my mind, it's like, it's, it's not raw. I think this is where my inner David Goggins comes in. Stay hard, be on the road. It is a lot easier. So when you're running, you can feel your shins and your calves just knocking on the ground. And um, I, I love the road because it's out there, it's open and whatever the case may be in the gym, you're out here, you're running and whatever, but obviously I need the weights. But needless to say, exercising is extremely important for a number of reasons. It, 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 it empowers your creative side. It opens up your mind to a level of thinking and makes sure that you that your brain is functioning. So yes, some of us are doing it for the gram like me. <laughs> but <laughs> the reality is, is that the benefits to your mind is far outweighs the benefits that happens to your body. Your yeah. body, yes, don't get me wrong, there are definitely benefits. I mean, your risk of a stroke drops, your risk of a heart attack drops, yeah. all these little things. The plus side for an entrepreneur is that your mind starts thinking differently about things. There's a certain chemical that goes into your brain. It's called dopamine. That is your pleasure reward. And what happens is when you're going through a hard day, the run actually de-stresses you and actually resets your inner, your, your inner ecosystem to really look at things. And that is why it's important. Now, reading books opens up your mind to other thinking. You cannot possibly go to church and listen to the same guy. Listen to someone else, read a different book, listen to a different author, listen to a different person. Same thing with your mentors, have different perspectives, 
maybe on the same topic or on a variety of topics. Having a being, being able to speak on a variety of topics helps your conversation for your business. Yeah. It really does. You don't want to be monomaniacal about one particular topic. You want to be able to have a conversation across different industries if you can. Um, spiritually, prayer is important. Meditation is important. I do meditate. When I walk, I go for meditation. When I do that, I do that once a week. I specifically do that on a Sunday. Um, it allows me to think about things. It allows me to look at certain things where I kind of feel like, you know, it, it kind of recalibrates. It's me showing me love. When I go out, I show myself love. The world is not going to show you love. You need to go out and you need to love yourself. You actually literally need to sit down and remind yourself of how special you are, how important you are. You got to remind yourself that sometimes the haters don't matter. What matters is what you say, what is important to you. Um, you got to re look at those things and you got to look at your life from all levels, from work, business, my marriage, for example, my home. How can I be better? How can I improve? So then you reset your mindset for the week as a result and you build habits by being micro focus on it where instead of focusing on it once a year you have your macro goal for that year but then you've got to have your micro goals that you've got to sit on like every day how do i do this so what helps me with my micro goals is mind body and spirit look at things i have to read i have to pray i have to train yeah that's those awesome. are definitely that, those are my focuses on my routine yeah no that's that's awesome and that's a lot and I, again i feel like uh, we should jump into that and unpack that a bit more but uh, just for time's sake um there's two more things that i that i want to know from you so the first yeah. one um is if if anyone is listening to this now and they feel like you know what this thing that gerard is doing is something that i maybe want to do and i want to look at um what is the one piece of advice that you think is imperative to their success on their journey okay so what's imperative is um, listen. I think listen is important among many things. Like I would probably give you my top three. Listen, improve, and be consistent as, you, as much as you can. Um, you have to listen to your customers. Your customers are the most important thing. Everybody is going to have an opinion about your business. Don't be proud. Someone is going to tell you, hey, you're not doing this right. Because you've been in business, you feel like, how can this person tell me about my business? right? Listen, whether the advice is negative or positive, listen, right? The end result of that is that you need to take the bones and separate it from the meat. The things that work, take it. The things that don't work, chuck it, right? Listen to your customers. Your customers are not going to be happy about your pizza one day. I've had customers that are unhappy about, hey, my Gatsby, my pizza, whatever. Listen, find ways to improve because if you are not listening, you're not going to have a business. End of story, right? Your level of consistency, right, is not just dependent upon the quality of your product. It's also dependent upon your ability to show up when things are not going right. If you cannot show up, right, because of whatever number of reasons, right, be consistent in your speech, be consistent in your ability to re-go back, go back to it, start it up again and redo it. And whatever the case might be, there's nothing wrong with, I would say, failing, stopping and starting. Life happens. You cannot possibly afford to pay three staff members, maybe 20,000 Rand a month, and you're, you, you're not even making 7,000 Rand, for example, right? So if you need to stop for a while to build capital, do that, right? But be consistent with your vision. Be consistent with where you want to go. While I was doing LaBelle's, I did other things as well to make money, right? But the one thing I was consistent with was with LaBelle's. I stayed consistent with this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. I'm still consistent. I'm not where I wanted to be three years ago. Three years ago, I was supposed to be somewhere else, right? But five years on, I'm still working at it because the time might have changed, but the goal hasn't changed. The goalpost might have moved, but that I'm going to hit that goal. That's where I'm at. I'm going to hit that goal. One way or another, I'm going to hit that goal. And that's how I feel about it. And that's how you need to feel about it. It's just be consistent. If this is what you really want to do, if this is where you really want to be, be consistent with what you are doing and let that be the one that, that you are pretty much speaking out to. Um, so it's listen, consistency, and the third one was, if you could help me. You didn't mention uh, <laughs> it. <said> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so you need, to, you need to constantly evolve and you need to pay attention to those things. And that is something that is basically going to help you. Um, all the other stuff, ideas that will work, um, those are, I would say, the, the, the peripherals, the, the, peripherals the, 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 the end result of what's happening on the inside of your engine. 
you have to take care of the inside of your engine. Those are things that you've got to take care of. And that is extremely, extremely important. And what I feel is that you've got to sit down and, and, and take care of you in that regard when it comes to your business. It takes a lot. Believe me when I tell you, there were times when someone was telling me stuff and I was like, how can this person tell me? But then I, I, I basically listened. There was a bit of pride, I'm not going to lie. But as the time went on, I decided to put my, for that day, I decided to put my pride aside and actually listen to this person's conversation in my mind and say, okay, fine. What is this person saying? Is this something I want to do? Because when you are going through your business, everybody's going to have an idea that, that they feel is important that you need to do, yeah. right? And that might be an idea that will work. That might not be an idea that will work. You need to stay close to your lighthouse, stay close to your lighthouse, stay close to the thing that is guiding you to where you need to be. Because I believe that, there is something inside of you that leads you to where you need to be. And you need to follow, follow that. And then obviously pay attention to what's happening around you. Cool, man. That's so, what definitely. So I think your third one is maybe instinct. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> but that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> so look, the, the last thing just to, to um, tie this all up is... If people want to reach out to you or just want to follow you, where can they find you? Um, on the socials or email or websites or anything like that? Okay, so you can get me on um, Twitter at Killian Gerard, right? That's where you can get me. Um, you can also get me at um, on, on Instagram, which is um, at Gerard K. So just look for Gerard Killian on either side and you'll see me there. Um, I'm not, I basically make no beans about what I'm involved in and what I'm doing, so you can check it out there. Um, I'm not as consistent on social media, but I do reshare posts that I feel is important. There's one in particular that I've pinned to my, pinned to my, my, my Twitter feed where you can actually look at how to get your business up and running from a legal perspective when it comes to registration, um, SARS, et cetera, et cetera. An entire process that someone else has put up, which I felt was important because if you're going to if your friend who's a bookkeeper or an accountant, he's charging you maybe 700 Rand for that registration where you could actually pay 150 bucks for that thing straight to Cipro. You know what I mean? And it works out cheaper. All you need to know is how to do it, but people are scared to do it. So there's a process on my Twitter feed that will help with that process. And that's where you'll find me. Facebook, don't even go there. I just do memes. <laughs> I just do memes on Facebook. And if you uh, <laughs> check out what LaBelle's is doing, is there any way where um, they can check that out? Oh yeah, um, you can catch us on, on Instagram. Um, we are LaBelle's Foods on Instagram. Um, we also have Bell's Foods on Facebook. You can follow us there and you can check us out on Instagram as well. Also, we do have a website, labels.co.za. That's L-A-B-E-L-L-E-S, labels.co.za. So as a note, labels is French for the beautiful. That's what labels means. Awesome, man. Awesome. So I'll pop those links down in the description as well so people can just click on them. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for your wisdom and thanks so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it and know it's going to touch someone. Someone is going to watch this and they're going to be like, okay, you know what? This guy is laying down um, a road, some sort of blueprint for me that I can follow. And I hope it does yeah. reach someone and I hope that someone does find joy as well as basically a roadmap or a blueprint for them of how they can get to where they want to be. So thank you so much, yeah. again, Gerard. No, thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. Awesome, man. Thanks. Yeah, cool. Thank you, sir.